Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show with your spicy hosts, Tara and Sylvie. We show up every episode to expose, uncover, and share what we know about SEX. This isn't what you find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under-discussed, and we are doing what we can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, we invite you to get social. Our Instagram is the.sexed.show, and we would love for you to give us a follow. Today, we are exploring the world of polyamory and the unique challenges and opportunities that come with dating multiple people. Joining us for this conversation is Dr. Marie Tuin, who has a PhD in East-West psychology and is an expert in online dating with a focus on diverse relationships, including non-monogamy. We'll be covering a range of topics such as the philosophy of mindful dating and how it applies to polyamory and why the process of dating itself is valuable for personal growth. Additionally, we're going to delve into the unique opportunities and challenges of dating as a non-monogamous person and how to navigate that. Marie will also provide advice for those looking to meet other consensual non-monogamy folks, as well as insights on creating a good online dating profile that accurately reflects our desires and our boundaries. We'll also discuss the delicate issues of when to disclose our CNM status to potential partners and how to do so in a way that feels both authentic and respectful. And for those who have experienced rejection in dating, we'll explore ways to deal with it in a healthy and positive manner. So get ready for an enlightening conversation on modern love and relationships. And I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of where I am located today. This is the territory of the Indigenous people of Treaty 7 region and Métis region 3 of Alberta. I also wanted to acknowledge that there is a lot of smoke today and just calling in some healing and some extra love for the land that I'm on. Okay, so today our somatic inquiry is going to be based on body-mind centering, which is an integrated and embodied approach to movement, the body, and consciousness. So it's an experiential study that was based on the embodiment and application of anatomical, physiological, psychophysical, and development principles. And BMC was founded by Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. And the following somatic exercise combines elements from five fundamental categories of BMC movement, which is yielding, pushing, reaching, grasping, and pulling. So let's start by finding a comfortable position. And if it feels good to you, you can close your eyes. Take a few moments to feel your body in the space. Allow your weight to settle into the ground beneath you. Breathe deeply and feel yourself yielding to the pull of gravity, letting go of any tension in your muscles. Yielding is a state of surrender where we let ourselves be without any force or effort. Feel the support of the ground underneath you and notice how your body responds to this support. Now, gently start pushing into the ground or surface beneath you. If you're lying down, this could be pushing with your back or if you're standing, pushing with your feet. Or if you're sitting, maybe pushing against the resistance of your bottom. Feel the resistance, the force you generate, and how your body reacts to this. Pushing allows us to experience our strength and solidity. Observe the energy flow from your center to the periphery of your body as you push. Once you've grounded yourself with pushing, let's begin to reach out with our limbs. If you're lying down, you can reach out with your arms, legs, or even your head, your tailbone. If you're standing, reach out as if you're trying to touch something just beyond your grasp. Feel the sense of extension, elongation of your muscles and your bones and the space you're creating. Really take up space in this world. Next, imagine that you have something you want to hold in your hands. 
or your feet, or even in your mouth. You can curl your fingers, your toes, your lips around it, as if you're grasping that object, whatever that object may be. Feel the sense of contact, the tension and the relaxation of your muscles as you grasp and release. Notice the sensations of holding and notice the sensations of letting go. Finally, visualize pulling that imaginary object closer to your body. Feel the shift in your body as you pull, the engagement of your muscles, the sensation of drawing something towards your center. The pulling movement allows us to integrate and embody our experiences. So after going through all of these movements, take a moment to rest and notice any sensations or emotions that may have arisen. Perhaps you can reflect on your experiences with each movement category, notice which ones felt easier, notice which ones felt more challenging, notice any insights or shifts in your body or your mind. And remember, the idea is not necessarily to perform these mo movements perfectly, but to explore and embody these fundamental movement patterns and how they feel in your body. And with that, we'll go on with the podcast. Mm, thanks, Sylvie. You're I've welcome. never done that before. <laughs> A new one for me too. I've been experimenting with some IFS and some BMC, and I really enjoyed that one last time I tried it. And welcome, Marie, to the show. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to connect, and I'm so looking forward to this conversation. How was the somatic inquiry for you? Because you didn't even know what this was going into it. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I spend so much time on my computer every day, you know, doing Zoom sessions or talking to people and writing emails that every chance I have to get into my body, it's just so delightful. And I loved this somatic inquiry. I was really into it, the pushing, the pulling, the grasping. Yeah, it felt really nice. I thought it was quite a good one to open up something on polyamory and mindful dating because we do a lot of that in polyamory and mindful dating, right? The pushing, the pulling, the reaching, the grasping, you know, when, <laughs> oh when God. to let go, when to hold on, you know, and, and yes. it felt, it felt very in alignment with today's topic, which is why I chose it. Wow. That is brilliant. I didn't even think about that, but yes, I mean, and dating in general. Yeah. It's like when to push, when to pull, when to grasp or not grasp. <laughs> Yes, it's really, really perfect. Thank you for that. I didn't even think about it, but it's perfect for this conversation. Cool. So let us know, was there anything we missed in the intro about you that you would like to share with us? Tell us a little bit more about who you are. Mm. Well, I think you really did a, a great um, <laughs> survey of uh, the things I do. So yes, I'm a dating and relationship coach um, for people across the relationship diversity spectrum, across different backgrounds, including folks who are non-monogamous. I did my dissertation on the topic of compersion in consensually non-monogamous relationships, which is empathic joy, the idea that we can feel happy for our partners when they're experiencing joy with other partners. So that's kind of my area of research and expertise in that field. And then the last few years, I've just been, you know, coaching my butt off and exploring what it means for people in real life and supporting people on their journey. And that looks so many different ways. But yeah, I've been developing this framework of mindful dating, which I think is so helpful for people who are on the dating scene and super passionate about it. So thank you so much for having me. Amazing. We're so excited. Oh, yeah. So before we get any further, for people who don't know what non-monogamy means or polyamory means or consensual non-monogamy, there's different terms for it right now, like ethical non-monogamy, consensual non-monogamy, polyamory. Do you have any definitions that you would like to share? Or is there anything that you think people should know if this is kind of the first 
situation that they've had brushing up against non-monogamy? Yeah. So the term consensual non-monogamy is actually an umbrella term that will include different relationship types where engagement, you know, sexual and or romantic engagement with more than one person at a time is allowed and, you know, not necessarily, you know, acted upon, but it's a philosophy where, you know, this is not out of the boundaries of the relationship and everyone is in the know about it. There's no hiding, it's not cheating, there's no secrets. So that's consensual non-monogamy. But under that umbrella, we have polyamory, which typically includes people who form emotional bonds with more than one person at a time. And then there's also swinging, where typically it's couples who are doing swaps, but more on a, on a sexual level without necessarily intending to create deep emotional romantic bonds. There's also relationship anarchy, which, you know, is kind of like throwing hierarchy out of the window and looking at really what wants to be born with each person that people are in a relationship to. There's solo polyamory, which means that your primary relationship is with yourself. You're not necessarily nesting or bonding with one primary partner. And then there's the broader category of open relationships, and that can mean different things. But so I just want to clarify, like polyamory is typically used for these kinds of emotional bonds and consensual non-monogamy kind of includes everyone who is not monogamous. Except people who are cheating, because <laughs> that's not consensual. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, that was a really great way of articulating all the different ones. <laughs> I know it can get really confusing even online. Like people don't like labels, mm-hmm, <laughs> I mm-hmm. find. Yes. And even myself, like I've struggled with it. You know, we used to call ourselves swingers, being in the lifestyle. And then I'm like, I don't know if I identify with everything that this stands for. And so now I usually go to just an open relationship. And I mean, it can change from situation to situation and person to person. I don't know if I'm polyamorous because I don't have time to have multiple partners. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. a lot of work. I watch my friends who are polyamorous and I'm like, that is a commitment. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Totally. Right. Yeah, I like the term open relationship too, because it kind of just implies like, yeah, it's open and it's not as maybe rigid of a box. It can mean some different things, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I use ethically non-monogamous and that's as far as I care to define it because there might be some experiences that are definitely more like swinging experiences with my partner. And there may be experiences that are more dating experiences that are just me and that are definitely more emotional. But it's not one style or another necessarily consistently. And so I don't like, I don't like to define it as anything more than ethically non-monogamous when it comes to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in practice, you know, like relationship styles usually are fluid over the period of one's life or one's long-term relationships. So, you know, if you take a snapshot, like a camera snapshot at one moment, it might look like swinging. Another camera snapshot might look like polyamory, depending on what is going on in people's lives and who they meet and where they're at. So I think it's important to remind ourselves, like, well, we might go into one style at some point, but we're never locked into it. You know, we can always change and, and chances are we will change. I love that because the whole idea of, of being open, right, is to have that flexibility and then, you know, being in, in something that's supposed to be flexible and then locking ourselves into even more strict standards of behavior can feel like out of the frying pan and into the fire. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I'm i just like thinking here. So what are what are some unique challenges that people who are consider themselves in open relationships might encounter when they're especially when they're dating I I mean I have my own but I'd love to hear from you of what people have been saying about that right right yeah I mean dating as a non-monogamous or consensually non-monogamous person definitely has its opportunities but of course it has its challenges because 
first of all, there's only about four to five percent of the U.S. population right now who is in some sort of non-monogamous relationship. So right away, the pool of people that are going to be willing to date you is smaller. So that's one challenge that can feel a little bit limiting. There's, you know, a few online dating apps that cater to non-monogamous folks. And especially for people in more rural areas where there's not a a big hotbed of consensual non-monogamy, it can feel like, gosh, I want to, I want to conduct my relationships that way, but there's not enough people around, you know, finding people who not only do you really like and resonate with and connect with and have chemistry with, which just generally speaking can be hard, but also to find people who are in that mindset of consensual non-monogamy can be challenging. And, you know, that's not even talking about the discrimination that non-monogamous folks face. Oftentimes people are online just disclosing that they are non-monogamous and they might hear from monogamous folks, you know, like things that are insulting or just rejecting or just not nice. So, so that's another thing that people face. I heard recently that being non-monogamous today is kind of like being gay in the 90s, that it was really, really hard to, well, you know, in certain areas, especially like you said, in rural areas or areas outside of big cities where there was some sort of a scene, that being gay just in rural areas was was really difficult. How did you find other partners? There's a show in the UK called Little Britain and they have they had a sketch that it was a very old comedy series which would probably not fly today because of the amount of political incorrectness but there was a a comedy sketch with a guy who was the only gay in the village and he was constantly dressing in very provocative ways and telling everyone that he was the only gay in the village and really making a big deal about how sad it was and then you know when whenever anyone else who was gay would hit on him he would get all freaked out and run away But it was quite funny. And just it reminds me of that, that today polyamory is kind of in that same space, that if you're in a big major city where there is a scene, you're probably fine. If you're on the outskirts of somewhere, you're going to have a harder time. And also, like you said, facing all of those stigmatizing slurs of, oh, you maybe you're just not a serious person. Maybe you just can't commit Maybe you're just a cheater who wants to uh, legitimize what they're doing. You know, maybe you just don't like depth and all these things that that people say about non-monogamous people. (laughs) It's the same kind of thing that they were throwing at the gay community 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So how would people really go about meeting others then and finding other people to connect with in the consensual non-monogamous communities? Yeah, so there's several ways. I always advise my clients to have a quote unquote portfolio of ways to meet people so that they don't get burnt out on just one. One of the first things I typically recommend is to join a non monogamy meetup. And even in smaller towns, there's usually one meetup. Uh, if you go on meetup.com and you Google or search for your, your town, your geographical area, and polyamory or non monogamy there's the opportunity to meet people in person, which I think is so validating for one's identity and really just feeling like, okay, like I'm not, I'm not a weirdo for thinking the way I I think, you know, like really like becoming non-monogamous can be an identity development journey where you have to try to put aside your monogamous conditioning And part of that is to be surrounded by community. Mm -hmm. So the thing about joining a community is that it does two things. You know, it helps you feel better about being non-monogamous. It helps you have that sense of, I'm not alone. There's other people who think like me. And then number two, it of course helps you meet people that you might want to date and might want to date you. So that's number one, join meetups and communities in person if you can. And then number two, there's online communities that are really great. One that I typically recommend is the Normalizing Non-Monogamy community. It's online. uh, It's linked to the podcast that's called Normalizing Non-Monogamy. And they have a really great online presence and 
chat board and people have really great conversations there. So even if you live in a rural area, you can have that kind of conversation and community online. And then of course, number three would be dating apps. Dating apps, they have a bad rap these days, but they really do help us reach people that we would not otherwise reach. And the best ones that I found for non-monogamous folks are OkCupid, Field, it's F-E-E-L-D. Um, there's one that's called hashtag open. It's a little bit smaller, but people in larger cities might really find that it's helpful for them. And then more recently, I've added Hinge to the list of good apps because it has a, a criteria where you can say that you are non-monogamous. Before it was just kind of assuming monogamy for everyone, but now it's not. So I think those four apps would be the top of my list. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I would have to agree, like in-person events typically mm-hmm. were my favorite. For three and a half years, we did a monthly meetup, me and my partner, uh, and it grew like people loved it. And, you know, there was the regulars. There was also people who would come from smaller towns and they would come for the weekend for so that they could attend the one night and also meet other people. And as much as I love the online stuff, and that's a great option for folks, I think the in-person really helps, like you said, like create more of your identity, learn more about it. Um, and also, I want to say like gives you practice for actually dating because <laughs> mm-hmm. you're meeting people and you're learning things to say and you're learning how to like kind of start negotiating and as much as I love like sex clubs, I feel trying to go for a place where there isn't any play on premise, maybe your first few times so that your nervous system doesn't get really dysregulated. Mm -hmm. And so you're there to just meet and learn how to communicate with other people in the community. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot one app that I wanted to mention. I'm sorry. It's called Bloom. And it's you you mentioned events and it's a it's an app that's uh, centered on events. So people who are hosting sex positive or non-monogamous or sometimes kink events typically post on Bloom. And then people who sign up for Bloom, they can say like, oh, yeah, I'm going to attend this event. And you can see who else is attending the event and send them a message. And it's you know, it's kind of like a cross between a dating app and an events app. So yeah, it's really helpful. That's awesome. Hey, just wrote that down. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. And I think it's mostly active in major cities, but it's expanding. So hopefully it will be everywhere very soon. And you talk a lot about mindful dating, Marie. Tell us Mm -hmm. what mindful dating means to you and what's your philosophy around that? Yeah. So mindful dating is the idea that dating is not just a means to an end. Typically, we think dating is just this chore, this like, ugh, I have to go date because I want to have a partner. And we forget that there is value in the process. And what value is there? To me, it's that idea that we can observe how we are in relationships We can observe other people. We can learn a lot from navigating this process of dating with mindfulness, which means kind of taking a step back and looking at what is actually happening and what can I learn about myself? What can I learn about humanity in this process of dating? So getting a lot of personal growth out of the dating process to me is, you know, in a nutshell, what mindful dating means. I mean, you have to have some introspective abilities to be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Which not everyone has. Which is where coaching comes in. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And I think, you know, that's something that everyone can learn. You know, like we might not all have been taught introspective abilities, but, you know, I think dating is such a great entry point for many people to start having this kind of introspection because it's so compelling. We all put so much energy, really emotional energy and time and effort to create good relationships, to create good love lives. And that is the number one factor of happiness and life satisfaction for human beings, really, is to have great relationships. So even when, you know, like 
our hearts are not open and we play it cool and we think like, yeah, I don't really care that much. It's never really true. Like we all care very much about our relationships. And so dating can become this window into our soul, so to speak. And it can be a great motivation to get to know ourselves better. Yeah. And I mean, you can still do this with current partners. It doesn't have to be new people. You can mindfully date your husband. You yes. Know? <laughs> yes. Thank you for that. I was just thinking of that. I'm like, I should, you know, when we have date night, me and my fiance, we should just, I should be more mindful of that and not just, oh, this is the routine. Like how did the date go? And what was our conversation like and what came up and what was challenging? I mean, it doesn't have to be with new partners. Yes, yes. And oftentimes, you know, with our current partners that we've been with for a long time, we we forget to be curious and we forget to be present because we think we know them. We think like, oh yeah, like I already know you, I chose you, we're locked in, we're good. But we can lose this sense of like, yeah, like in the moment, really exploring who this person is and what our connection is and what it wants to be. And that's part of mindfulness too. It's like that curious, fresh approach to the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if somebody's, you know, interested in in consensual non-monogamy, maybe even polyamory, and they're a little bit too nervous to go to a physical event, what are some what's some advice on how to create an online presence? Like, should they be upfront with wanting this type of relationship or curious about these types of relationships? Uh, like, what what should they have on on their dating profiles? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. I would definitely advise being honest and upfront about it and probably going to the apps where it's easier to do so. Uh, for example, Field definitely will have people be very explicit in the kind of things they're curious about, what are their hard limits, what are their desires. So it's easier to go on an app like this and say like, hey, this is what I'm open to. Versus an app that's more mononormative, that kind of tends to assume monogamy, like Match.com, for example. So I would gravitate towards those apps where it's more normalized. And that said, I would also encourage people who are starting to explore non-monogamy, curious about it, to go on online discussion boards, like Facebook groups. There's a lot of great groups on Facebook that are really great for starting discussion threads and saying things like, yes, you know, I'm curious about polyamory. Here's what my situation with my partner is, or maybe I don't have a partner. What do you guys recommend? And typically a lot of people will respond and give their advice, give their welcome and help already start that conversation, which helps normalize and helps the process of self-discovery for people who are just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's some that is some great advice. What if somebody is like super well versed in non-monogamy and they already have a few partners on the go and maybe they're struggling a little bit with should I start dating again? Should I should I add another person to this mix? Like at what point do you kind of know that you're at your limit? Mm. Yeah, there's a great expression for that. It's called polysaturated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when do you know that you're polysaturated? Well, that's a good question. And of course, it is different for different people. Some people are extroverted and they really thrive on a lot of different connections and they get a lot of energy out of it. Some people are more introverted. They really need to manage their energy and their time very closely to, to stay healthy and so I would just do a lot of introspection around that and maybe even communicate with existing partners, you know, like how, how is our relationship, you know, like are everyone's needs more or less met? What do we need to do to help meet each other's needs and see, you know, like a case by case basis of, is there really, are there parts of me that are not getting seen in my current relationships? Are there needs that are not getting met? Why do I want more partners? Is it from a place of like, yes, I really want to expand. I want to love more. I want to do more. 
or sometimes there could be situations where, oh gosh, like I just kind of need a distraction from sticking points in my current relationships and I just need to find the next shiny object. I think no one is immune to that. Hmm. So I think to do some introspection about the why mm -hmm. and seeing what really makes the most sense in the ecosystem that you're building, because really non-monogamy creates those ecosystems of people. And we, what we do affects everyone in that system of people we're connected to. Absolutely. Yeah, that's such a great analogy. Oh my goodness. And it could even be like decisions. Like what if somebody can't wear condoms, right? And you're like, well, potentially like let's fluid bond as partners. I mean, there's other people, if you're polyamorous, who are going to be impacted by that. And you need to do your due diligence of being consensual and having this discussion with other partners and see how they feel about it too. And what what their risk assessment is on certain things. And I know COVID brought up a lot of those conversations for the non-monogamous communities. Yeah. Right, right. And that, that sort of also dovetails into the fact that you mentioned that there's both opportunities and challenges in the dating process as a non-monogamous person, that it's not just a means to an end. So maybe also elaborate on what are the opportunities and challenges of dating as a non-monogamous person and all of those things that can come up that are challenging? Like Tara mentioned, you know, going through COVID with multiple partners or navigating safe sex with multiple partners. What are the opportunities there? And also, how do you get over those challenges? Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, really, I think starting with opportunities, it's so great to not need one person to fill all of our needs and that is a huge opportunity when it comes to dating because I work with a lot of people who are monogamously oriented and while there's nothing wrong with that I totally support people who just really prefer monogamy it can become really difficult to find that one person who will hit all the spots and it can be very frustrating you know when when you don't find that person and in a non-monogamous paradigm, you don't have to have everything in one person. You can really, really enjoy your interactions with a lot of different people who don't meet all of your needs because you don't need them to. So that's first opportunity. I think it kind of broadens this color palette of possible romantic and sexual connections, and it broadens it to more people, more experiences. And Opportunities include also practicing communication skills, practicing self-inquiry, self-knowledge, because when you are interacting with more than one person in, in a paradigm that's not a normalized paradigm that we've all grown up with, there is no default mode. You can't just go on automatic pilot and date someone and people will just assume, okay, this is the track we're on. You have to really define what is it that you want out of this? What is it that you need? How, you know, how do our desires and our needs really interact and connect and are compatible or not? So it requires a lot of emotional intelligence, self-knowledge and ability to communicate. And then of course, challenges are many because more people in, you know, will involve more complexity. There's always going to be more opportunities for rejection, disappointment, hurt feelings, everything that would be challenging in in regular, quote unquote, dating would potentially be multiplied the more people you are dating. So you have to really be putting aside some time for conversations about what people need, what are their boundaries, what are their fears things like sexual health, you have to be really on top of it to make sure that people don't become betrayed, you know, by lack of integrity, lack of communication, lack of explicit communication about what people need. So typically, though, in people who are non-monogamous and experienced with it, there's actually a culture of disclosure, which is really nice. People are not as likely to shame STIs and those kind of conversations don't have to be as heavy 
So that's another opportunity is to be just more cars on the table, like really be who we really are. Yeah. I've, I've said, uh, I think on this podcast, I can't remember, but I'm like having a non-monogamous relationship is like a magnifying glass over you and your partners. And, you know, if something's good, if you're a great communicator, if you're good at self-reflection, that's going to be magnified. If you're not good at those things, that's also going to be magnified. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. just taking that into account and noticing where where your strengths are and maybe where your weaknesses are too. That can be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And rejection also is a big part of it, which I don't think any of us are trained or learned about how to navigate rejection. And in these communities, I feel like it's a little bit higher than in most monogamous communities. So <laughs> this is a question I get asked a lot is how how do you navigate the the rejection when somebody says, no, thank you, or ghosts you even? Ghosting's a big thing. Mm-hmm. It's so hard, rejection. Like I really struggle with it to be honest. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's hard. It registers as physical pain in your brain. It's how, you know, it's it's that real. Like it's kind of like it's a real big pain for us. And and it's evolutionarily programmed for us to equate rejection with survival threat. Mm. Because, you know, as humans, we're we're herd animals, we are bound to be together and connect and depend on each other's for survival. So when we get rejected, especially in an intimate, romantic context, like our reptilian brain will get activated and say like, no, like alarm, this is a threat to our survival. This is a big deal. And so it really, really hurts and destabilizes us. So yeah, how do we deal with that? (laughs) I think, first of all, giving ourselves the space to feel our feelings is really important. Second of all, trusting our no or their no. If the rejection comes from another person, really trusting that if they were not a full yes, this connection just wasn't meant to be or it wasn't the best thing that could have happened to us because there wasn't a full yes. So seeing rejection, not just as this reflection on our own value, but as this idea that, okay, well, it's a redirection towards another connection that will be a green light. And really being careful about what the meaning we attribute to the rejection events is, you know, like, do we make it mean that we're not good enough? Do we make it mean that this other person sucks? Do we make it mean that, you know, there's something wrong with us or we're too much, et cetera? Or can we just really look at it as, okay, well, this was not the best thing that could have happened. And it is a a redirect or it's, you know, it's one person. It's not a reflection on who I am as a person. Yeah. So meaning making is super important. It's so interesting that you mentioned the evolutionary programming as well because that's why you see people go into fight flight or freeze right when they get rejected and you know that's when sometimes you can see these quite bad behaviors when when people are rejected I've often seen it with men more than women but that they'll get quite physically or emotionally aggressive either over text message or in person and try and really persuade you that you're wrong or Mm -hmm. why they're amazing and that can feel incredibly threatening and it's just a like you said it's just a survival reaction because they're Mm -hmm. feeling physical pain and that's what their nervous system does it lashes out is there a good way to sort of meditate on that and like mediate your response and know when your body is going into that state and sort of respond in a more considerate and less treated way when you're being rejected Mm, right yeah it's really the skills of self-regulation so identifying when you are going into a state you can maybe become really aware of what it feels like in your body maybe your forehead gets really warm maybe your heart starts beating fast maybe you start noticing that you're not 
thinking clearly or that your thoughts are very intense and very negative. So whatever it is for you, and you might even think about in the past, you know, the times that I have gotten into fight or flight, what have I noticed? What, what was that like? Just physically, somatically. And then not communicating from that place, if you can help it, just kind of giving yourself a break to then self-regulate. And that can look uh, many different ways for people, maybe going for a walk, maybe doing some breathing exercises, maybe going for a really intense workout, taking a bath. People have all kinds of ways to connect with their body in a way that feels grounding and hopefully pleasurable to kind of get yourself back to a nervous system state that's just able to deal with the reality of thing of things that are happening in a compassionate way rather than a um, a reactive fight or flight or freeze way yeah the somatic inquiry from t- today's episode might also be helpful. <laughs> yes. So if you're going through react if, through a reactive rejection right now, you might want to rewind and go through that a few times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you made a good point of saying rejection's not just for the person receiving the rejection. It's also hard for the person rejecting. And mm-hmm. I know I struggle more with that than receiving rejection. Mm-hmm. And that was something I had to really work with in boundary and consent, consent classes. And were you a ghost to Tara? Me? Yeah. Um, maybe in some cases, but I also really didn't like when people would like do the fight back. Even today I had to say no to a client. I was like, I don't think you're the right fit for me sorry, but I'm, I'm not willing to work with you. And they like got so irate with me and of course a male, of course. And, <laughs> and you know, when somebody rejects me now, I always try and come from a p- place of compassion. That was probably tough for you. And usually I'll start off with saying, thank you for your no. And you, cause I want them to continue to advocate for themselves. I don't want to be the reason that somebody won't say no in the future yeah that's such a good way to come at it yeah and kind of the opposite of feeling those icky rejection feelings is compersion which I feel is kind of a new term I I think I learned about it maybe nine years ago and even autocorrect like didn't recognize (laughs) it so it's like what is this word it still doesn't (laughs) did you mean compassion Compassion? yes exactly (laughs) compression compression (laughs) yes that one too um so maybe would you be willing to give some examples marie of what compersion can be because it doesn't just come up either in like in relationships it can come up in everyday life too yeah and also also maybe addressing the fact that because whenever i talk about non-monogamy and compersion people who haven't experienced it yet or at all they tend to be really incredulous that you could ever feel such a thing and i'll get a lot of like oh well maybe some weirdos feel that but i could never like is that true from your research can some people just never or can that be learned is it a learned behavior well Of course, everyone has felt compersion in one area of their lives or more. Maybe not in the intimate realm, but people can always relate to the idea of being happy for their friend who got a promotion or got a really great life event, or even happy for their kid who is learning how to walk and is super excited. And you can, oh, this this smile and this joy is is infectious you know like it can make you smile back like it's that joyful empathy like I think we can all relate to some of that wherever it is when we care about someone and they experience something really good and it's not a threat to us we tend to be happy for them but in romantic relationships oftentimes we would you know, just jump into interpreting this situation. Oh, my partner is experiencing something joyful with another person in a sexual or intimate context. Well, that's a threat. I can't be possibly happy for them because even though I care about them, this is not 
how my mind works. So I don't think it's necessarily possible for people who are not open to the idea that they could potentially, you know, feel compersion in those kind of contexts. But that said, I mean, compersion is such a fluid concept and it takes many different shapes. I've actually talked to some of my research participants who were in a monogamous marriage and the woman cheated on the man and then the man discovered the cheating, the affair. And he told me in an interview that while it was devastating and he felt a lot of jealousy and a lot of rage in that moment when he first discovered that she had been cheating, he also could recognize in retrospect the seed of compersion. There was a part of him that felt like, oh, I can understand why she did that. And at some level, I'm happy for her because that's something that I would have wanted to do, but I didn't give myself the permission to do. So even, you know, in addition to all of the negative, devastating feelings, there was a little bit of a seed of compersion. And then, you know, it took a long time for them to decide like, okay, we're going to open the relationship. We're going to do that ethically and properly and openly. And then now they're both experiencing a lot of compersion. So that story makes me think, well, there's no one for whom it's totally impossible. Even when people come from an, a very monogamous, very normative paradigm, they might still be able to experience it in that, in that context. Just, you know, I wouldn't expect to experience only compersion. There's probably going to be a lot of other emotions that come along with it. Yeah. I was just going to say, so compersion can exist with jealousy at the same time. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I didn't know that. Well, it's kind of like feeling bittersweet, right? You can feel sadness and joy at the same time. You can feel grief and gratitude. You can feel opposite emotions at the same time. And that is part of the complexity of life and human emotionality. Amazing. Yeah. And I think what you mentioned about that bittersweetness and about the threat level is interesting because I remember reading Lady Chatterley's Lover when I was in high school. It was one of the books on our reading list because in Europe, we actually have sex positive reading lists. Wow. But I remember Lady Chatterley's Lover intrigued me. Like that was just like a fascinating story because, so for anyone who hasn't read it, you can read the cliff notes or I can just give them to you briefly. It's a a guy who goes off to war and he he's just gotten married. He has a, a new, young, pretty wife. He goes off to war. He gets uh, very, very crippled in the war and he comes back and he's wheelchair bound. And we don't, we don't know the, the details of, of what else is not working, but it becomes clear that their sex life at that point is, is pretty dead in the water. And he suggests to her that she take a lover mostly because he he wants an heir and he would like her to get pregnant and have a child and pretend that the child is his. But he actively encourages her to go off and have sex with the gardener. I mean, he doesn't, not, not necessarily the gardener, but that's who she goes and finds. And he only then gets very angry when when it becomes discovered or when other people in the in the town start talking about it that's when he starts to get enraged. And that makes sense, Marie, from the threat perspective, because for him, it wasn't necessarily, I mean, there was that that seed of compersion that you talk about, where he thinks, you know, my wife deserves some pleasure. She doesn't deserve to be stuck at home with, with me and not have any sexual pleasure. But at the same time, as soon as his status level in the community was threatened, mm-hmm. that compersion went out the window super fast. So does the process of compersion mean sitting down and identifying what are your core threats? Like, what are you most worried about losing? And then having communication around that. Mm. Yes, yes. I have this website called whatiscompersion.com and people can download a small ebook that I created. And in that ebook, there is a questionnaire where people can kind of evaluate where they are really strong in their ability to create compersion in their current relationships and where there might be weaknesses. So I would encourage people to just go through that questionnaire and see like, what are the things that maybe are weak links and where I might feel threatened? And yeah, it's super important because if you can 
be aware of those. You can keep them in front of you and and work to address them rather than have them be in your shadow and have them just, you know, act out and, and control you without you totally knowing who is in charge. Because these forces are very, very powerful. You know, that that fear of losing status and losing face. Oh my God, the competition, the comparison, the feeling not good enough, the personal insecurities, the relational insecurities, the relational insecurities, meaning like, well, I don't know if I'm going to lose my partner. Maybe they're going to fall in love with someone else at a deeper level than they're in love with me. Like there's so many fears that come with inviting non-monogamy into our lives. And it's totally natural. It's totally normal. And we have to, yeah, do an inventory of them, really look at how we can maybe strategize around them. Like, are there things that we can do to diminish the potential pain and harm and chaos that would ensue? Like, do we need relationship agreements around those things? Or are there fears that we just need to really kind of give a hug to and look at how do we bring more love into those areas and choose, you know, choose the risk perhaps with an open heart and open eyes rather than just kind of plunge into it and have all of these things come up all at once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that goes straight to communication and boundaries really, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of it does. And I would add just personal work, you know, some of it I think can be dealt with with the relationships and boundaries and communication and some of it will just never be it will never go away and you have to just deal with it internally and say like okay well I'm jealous I feel the emotion and yet I would rather my partner have freedom and even though I can't feel a fully embodied kind of exalted compersion Right now, I'm going to have a compersive attitude. I'm going to support my partner seeking out their their highest joy. And I'm going to trust that, yeah, with our boundaries and communication, you know, we're putting the chances on our sides for, for that to be successful. But I'm going to still be, you know, nurturing myself in the places that don't feel happy and exalted all the time. Yeah. That's that sounds so tough though sometimes. It sounds really difficult. And also, you know, jealousy is such a powerful emotion that living with it, I, I assume it also raises levels of stress in your body and cortisol and probably isn't isn't awesome to live with high levels of jealousy. So if you are experiencing a lot of jealousy and really struggling with compulsion what would your advice be as a coach? Well, it depends on the context always. There might be opportunities to kind of take a step back, you know, with your current partners and say like, okay, are there things where we can pump the brake a little bit and just give, you know, give me some breathing room here and stop Mm -hmm. the constant triggering of those threat responses? That's one way to do it is to diminish the stimuli or the threat Another way would be to seek more support, more community, more outlets where you can actually show up with your jealousy and that being normalized. Yeah. Because oftentimes like people are isolated with their jealousy and therefore they feel a lot of shame around it. They feel a lot of doubt. They're, you know, mononormative slash, you know, sex negative slash threatened brain takes over the narrative and that can be so all-encompassing and so destabilizing so oftentimes yeah like having communities where jealousy is not looked at as this shameful thing it can actually be just this thing this emotion that erupts and there's so much power in removing that shame layer and having it be seen loved and normalized it could really change everything for somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I even notice in like Facebook groups I'm in every once in a while you get that anonymous post and someone's like, this happened. And now I'm feeling jealous and jealousy. It's, it's going to happen. It's part of non-monogamy. It's part of any relationship. 
you can be in a mon monogamous relationship and your husband can have a work wife <laughs> that they're around eight or nine hours a day. And that can create feelings of jealousy too, just as equally as being in a non-monogamous relationship with more than one person, which kind of leads me to like the future of these consensual non-monogamous relationships. And we we have already established these wonderful support systems in Facebook groups, there's online dating apps, there's way more events than there was 10 years ago. The events, in my opinion, are getting better, like these meetups, they're more informed, they're more trauma informed. And the people who are attending too, it's so diverse. There's so many different ways that they practice non-monogamy. So where do you see kind of the future of polyamory, of lifestyle people? Like, do you think it's going to grow? Do you think it's going to shrink? Mm. Well, I like the analogy that Sylvie uh, offered at the beginning of this podcast, like the analogy with the gay movement in the you know 70s, 80s, 90s. And I think, yes, non-monogamy is following in those footsteps. And I believe it will be increasingly recognized as a legitimate relationship identity and lifestyle I feel like it's already getting more normalized even you know like comparing to 10 years ago there's a lot more as you said more quality of information more breadth of resources out there so I do believe that it can become just like you know just like being gay or queer or or fluid it can become just more integrated in the ways that we look at relationships. And I think it can have a great impact on the whole of society and how we look at relationships and looking at relationships not as there's one way and that's the default and that's the only way that you can be socially acceptable in your relationships, but okay, what is it that I really want? What is it that really works for me? And if it's monogamy, let's choose that from a place of conscious awareness and freedom, not from a place of default. And right. if I want non-monogamy, then that's okay too. Let me go create that and find that and, and do that in a very open, ethical, non-judgmental way. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate the idea of being conscious in what you decide and not just going to the default because so many people I know just went the default and... I mean, you know, growing up, these certainly weren't conversations that were available to us. There's more now. And I do find the younger generations, little Gen Z, they're way more open because they're more informed that monogamy, that being straight isn't the default anymore. And mm -hmm. it, I think it's, like you said, definitely changing, definitely shifting. Mm -hmm. There are still people out there, though. I mean, I will get people who ask me constantly about whether polyamory is just normalizing sex addiction oh, wow. or swinging, right? Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, is it just that someone can't keep it in their pants and so they have to? So it's those kind of stigmas that are still out there. What do you respond when you hear those kind of stigmas from people? Oh, my gosh. I mean... <laughs> non-monogamous people will pretty much always tell you like it's not just about the sex I mean sex is part of it but there are so many needs outside of just our sexual needs that are getting filled by many people rather than just one you know like I was interviewing people who were saying like I just love that my partner has this other boyfriend because I hate to go camping and they really love to go camping. And I hate the fact that I I used to feel like I was preventing them from enacting their passions, right? But now they can go with their new boyfriend and everyone is happy. I can stay home with my new girlfriend and we can play video games. And that's what we love to do. And we can, you know, kind of spread the needs around. And some of it can be sexual. It can be like, wow, like I I really want a kink partner. And that kink partner cannot be my spouse or my nesting partner because I I just don't see the power dynamics you know being compatible with the same person so sure a lot of people do open the relationship because they want sexual diversity but typically they don't have 
necessarily like that much more sex than people who are monogamous. And I mean, just look at the cheating rates, of course, people who are supposedly monogamous. I don't know what the statistics are nowadays, but it's like 50% of them have had an affair over the course of their marriage. So, I mean... Yeah, it's it's yeah. between it's definitely between twenty five and fifty percent, and also there's under reporting, right? Because mm -hmm. there are always people who will never answer yes, even if they have. Mm -hmm. And also, what constitutes cheating? Because that is different for every couple and every relationship. For some people, that's going to be texting someone else without telling your partner. For right. some people, it's going to be going out for dinner with someone that isn't your partner. For some people, it's going to be making out with someone. And for some people, it's going to be, you know, penetrative sex. And there's there's different levels of, of what constitutes cheating. And we saw it with Bill Clinton, right, back in the 90s. Like, I did not have sex with that woman. Like, he was so adamant that there was no, there was no affair there. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's such a cop-out because every interaction that we have with another person is some sort of an energy exchange, an emotional exchange. Mm -hmm. And depending on how your partner feels about your energy exchanges with other people, that's going to make up whether or not they consider your interactions with those people ethical or not ethical. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a case by case basis. And, and of course the other question that came to mind when you talked about sex addiction is what is sex addiction and how do we define that? That's another mm -hmm. you know, can of worms. <laughs> mm -hmm. Calling anything, calling anything an addiction in this society is very shaming and trivializing to the person. It's dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about it. We won't get into it now, but you know, the treatment for sex addiction being the same as something like alcohol addiction or something else and not looking at underlying trauma and why a person might compulsively have various needs, whether that is alcohol or sex or drugs but something to numb some sort of a pain that is clearly underlying that and to just brush it off as like, oh, that person's just a sex addict. It's just, it's it's trivializing and dehumanizing, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It's almost like too easy. And I mean, do I, do I meet people for whom like it seems like they are using the non-monogamy label as kind of like an excuse to distract themselves from their relationship issues and want to go and have sex with as many people as possible because that's a distraction for them. Sure, I do meet people like that. I'm not going to say that everyone who identifies as non-monogamous is a saint and enlightened and more enlightened than the rest of us, but, but there's really no correlation in mm -hmm. my book. Like I meet a ton of monogamous people. I meet a ton of non-monogamous people and you know, I don't know who I would say there's the more <laughs> function versus dysfunction. Like, we're all trying to figure love, life, relationships, and sex. We're all trying to figure that out for ourselves. And some people do it in a non-monogamous container. Some people do it in a monogamous container. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a grand theory that that has been born yet. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you seen have you seen it be possible for people to experience NRE with more than one person at the same time or do you find that typically NRE and limerence and that feeling of falling in love that that initial buzz do you find that it can only happen with one person at a time or have you seen it happen with multiple people at a time? Gosh, I've I mean I've experienced it myself with more than one person at a time. And that was one of the cool. experiences that led me down the road of exploring non-monogamy more, um, more academically, like, oh my gosh, like I've been told that love is singular, but now I'm experiencing it with more than one person. What does that mean? So yeah, I definitely think it can be experienced with more than one person. So, What about you? <laughs> what would you say to that? I haven't yet experienced limerence with more than one person mm -hmm. at a time, but I haven't given myself much of a chance to experience it with more than one person at a time is also what I would say to that. Because I think I also, as a mom, yeah. I have limited time. I feel like it, it, these little people in my life who are not 
you know, obviously romantic relationships, but they are lo deeply loving relationships that I have with my children. They take up a lot of my time, a lot of my attention, a lot of my heart. And you have to have time to date. And I also have my husband, who is my, my life partner. And I tend to get saturated very quickly at maybe one extra partner. I have not really experimented with more than that, just simply from the point of view of I, I refuse to take too much time away from my children. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair to them, especially at the ages that they currently are, you know, at five and seven, they, they require a lot of mom time. And I think that's where I still struggle with some, you know, judgment from society and whatever, which maybe men experience less. But I feel that if I'm out of the house and missing sitting down for dinner with them more than two or three times a week, that I'm a really, you know, terrible parent, which is not necessarily true, but it is a story that I tell myself and which I hear on mom's groups and other places and whatever else. So that's to say that I don't think I've allowed myself to really experience mm -hmm. limerence with more than one person. But mm -hmm. I I don't know whether it's true or not. That's why I asked if anyone else has experienced it, because I'm always curious. Limerence is so much fun. Like, I can't imagine <laughs> how much um, more amazing it must be to feel it for more than one person. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's so many colors and flavors, you know, of like being in love, falling in love. Yeah. Like, I, I know actually limerence is something rather specific, but yeah, it's it's a whole other conversation of like what what is it exactly? Can we experience it in the same way or will it feel different from person to person? Yeah, it's so so interesting to and you know, leave the door open for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tara, have you experienced it with more than one person? I was trying to think about that while both of you were talking and yeah, probably like with a couple you know, and, Ooh. you know, having that different NRE for each one of them and really wanting to spend a lot of time with them and really just feeling tender towards who they both were as a person and what I got from each of them. And yeah, I, yeah. So in that sense, which is a little bit different too. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Oh. And it's interesting because as I was talking about my children, I was suddenly realizing that, like, of course you can experience, like, you know, <laughs> deep love for, for more than one person at the same time. Like, I have more than one child and I don't love them only one at a time. Like, I both love them both together. So it is funny, right, how we how we class r romantic and sexual attraction love as being so different to you know family love or whatever whatever you want to call it but it, it's not right it's just it's just different people bring up different feelings of care in you and those feelings of care are just as valid no matter what kind of relationship it is mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. right like I love my friends too there are right. friends who I have zero romantic interest in but who I would I would like jump in front of a truck for them like for sure <laughs> yes oh my gosh yeah I have so many amazing kind of new friendships in my life right now and I was reflecting on the fact that I feel kind of saturated um yeah. the other day I was like I love people but I can't I can't have another friend right now like I need to cultivate the friendships I already have yeah so with that said what are the best practices for the healthiest relationships, whether those are romantic or friendships or, you know, let's be relationship anarchist for a minute. Like what are the best ways to have the best, like, you know, open relationships in your life and do them ethically and with boundaries and good communication? What are the, your top tips? Ooh, top tips. Well, what comes to mind is, you know, number one, taking responsibility for your emotions. That's always, I think, what allows me to have the best relationships is when I don't dump my emotion on someone else, whether it's a friend or a lover or partner, etc. Take responsibility for my own self-regulation. That goes with that first tip. And looking at how do I take care of myself so that I show up in a way that is 
as much as possible, really available, really open, really curious, really available to interact in a real way. Let's see, other top tips, get some support from others, you know, community, a coach, a therapist, basically like, again, we all have our relationships in ecosystems, you know, we're not isolated and putting all of our eggs in one basket is not typically going to lead to the best relationships. So the more of a love filled life we have, the more resilient we are to hurt feelings and kerfuffles and even rejection in individual romantic relationships. So I think these are the two is like, yeah, if you want really great intimate relationships or any kind of relationships, like also put a big flashlight on your individual ability to self-regulate and also your social networks and what else is happening in your life. I feel like those are great tips for any human being Mm -hmm. (laughs) and to create better relationships with anybody, even if they're not an intimate or a sexual relationship and just make things a little bit easier for yourself too. You're not alone and how to also work through those, those sticky parts a little bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you, Marie, so much for joining us today on the show. This has been so informative and I really hope that the listeners find a lot of value in everything that you shared. That was it was amazing. Thank you. And I want to ask, how can people find you? Where can they reach out to you if they're curious about knowing more? Thank you. Thank you for having me. And yeah, people can go to either one of my two websites. One is called whatiscompersion.com. And that's where I have the most research on non-monogamy and a, and a list of resources about compersion specifically. And people can book a free introductory 30-minute session with me if they're interested in knowing more about coaching with me potentially so it's very low pressure it's not a sales call it's really getting to know each other and seeing if there is a good fit for coaching and if people are more interested in the mindful dating side of things uh, go to loveinsight-dating.com and that is the website that's more about dating generally speaking and either one you can find how to reach me and and last thing I would say is follow me on Instagram and that's at love underscore insight underscore dating. I, I realized I've been following you for quite a while and I had oh no gosh. idea. Wow. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, that's who I'm interviewing. Oh, that's hilarious. Because <laughs> Sylvie set this up. So yeah, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that's what a nice surprise. Yeah. So her content is so good. Your content is so good. I'm constantly, I'm constantly pinning your content and, and bookmarking it and going back to it and looking at it again, because it's, I mean, your content is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if anyone is struggling, even if people are not non-monogamous, but they're just going through dating in general and want to be better at it, follow Marie, because she just has such incredibly clear, concise, and non-shaming insights that are so profound. So Marie, thank you so, so much for sharing your time with us today. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. Uh, we're both really, really big fans of your of your work and your insights, even though Tara didn't know it was you until just now. <laughs> but, oh, thank you. But yeah, thank you so much. And uh, we will definitely be in touch. Sounds great. Thank you for having me. It's been such a joy to get to know you both better and have this conversation. So I hope people got a lot out of it. Amazing. And thank you also to our guests and our listeners. Uh, Thank you for tuning in to Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access info, get social with us too. You can follow the show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or our individual Instagrams at sex ed for the modern bed and sex and sensibility where the E in sex is a three. So until next time, claim your Maybe. pleasure. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stay with you. <laughs> you. You can do it with me. I don't know if Zoom does that. Why don't you do the sign off, Tara? Okay. So until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body, and stay in presence.